are going to be sort of revolving around the MRI and, and, and the uh, biopsy indication. So hold your questions until Laurie finishes his. And Laurie, keep it to 20 minutes, if not less. Okay. <laughs> no problem. So, you know, we've just heard a terrific talk, and, and clearly there's some overlap. If you uh, think about the patient on surveillance who has an MRI, the idea is to find a target and biopsy it. And all of the comments that Mark made about the value of target biopsy apply to uh, surveillance. And in fact, a lot of the data that, that we have on this, which is fairly limited, has come from Mark. So I kind of anticipated, and we confirmed this as we were sitting here, that, <laughs> that there might be some overlap. So I'm going to talk a little bit about MRI, not too much, and then some about biomarkers and how these might go together. So here's Patrick Walsh, 2008, the discovery that would have the greatest impact on our field would be the development of accurate imaging of tumor within the prostate, and I think we are getting there, and MRI has uh, major potential impact. There, there is uh, uh, talk out there, and studies are going on of actually replacing the systematic biopsy in a patient with elevated PSA. No target means no biopsy, and we heard some of the data that would support that. Um, risk assessment for surveillance candidates, follow-up, accurate staging, preoperative assessment of local extent of disease, extracapsular extension, local recurrence, guiding thermal ablation, which is something I've been interested in and was going to try and add into this talk, but I don't think I will in the interest of time. Just, I'm just going to cover a couple of basic issues about technique and uh, principles. Uh, one, we, the, the key message about MRI and men on surveillance is we're not worried about resolution. We're not worried about finding the two or three millimeter cancer or seeing whether there's a bulge that is extending into the area of the neurovascular bundle. It's a very subtle finding. We're interested in finding large lesions. You need only 1.5 system, a pelvic phased array. You don't need the endorectal coil for this. The key point is multiparametric image acquisition and experienced radiologists. Less experienced radiologists tend to underestimate, uh, t tend to, pardon me, overcall lesions. Of course, one of the dangers here is we're going to end up finding positive MRI lesions on everybody and we'll be back where we started with overdiagnosis. Empty bladder, preferably no sexual activity for two or three days, a laxative prior, I think the key point is that once the patient's had a biopsy, you have to leave them, preferably three months minimum. Hemorrhage in the prostate will produce a positive signal, particularly on the T2-weighted image. You don't need that confounding your assessment. So wait three months. Uh, the endorectal coil is good if you're using it for staging. If you want to decide in a patient with high volume disease on one side, whether to spare the neurovascular bundle, we have good data that that is helpful, but you do not need it for this purpose, which is to take the favorable risk patient and find the, the uh, high risk lesion that is hidden in his prostate. So I just want to emphasize the point about a multi-parametric T2 diffusion weighted imaging, which I think has been the major advance Proton spectroscopy, which has been done and reported, but pr not widely embraced, and dynamic contrast MRI, and of course this is being used in the brain and other organs as well as the prostate. Uh, and just, just to cover some basics, the T2 gives morphology. It's a hypoechoic lesion. The dynamic contrast enhanced gives perfusion. It's a white lesion. You can see them there. The uh, spectroscopy gives you information about metabolism. But this is uh, fairly demanding in terms of the technique. It's expensive, and it almost certainly, if you do uh, diffusion-weighted imaging, is not required. And the uh, diffusion-weighted imaging is a very powerful technique that tells you about essentially cell density. And the key point here and again, I apologize if this is widely known, not widely known in my world, that the diffusion-weighted imaging measures the rate of water diffusing through cells. The key difference between Gleason 3 and 4 is that Gleason 3 has a good lumen 
and the cells are not as tightly packed together. So water moves more quickly through three than through four and five, and that is why the intensity of the diffusion-weighted image increases as you go from low to high-grade cancer. And of course, that is exactly what we want uh, with this technology, one that does not overdiagnose the small volume, particularly uh, low-grade cancer. The interpretation, you've heard about this PIRAD scheme. It's, it's hierarchical. The first score from the T2 and the diffusion weighted image, then you add in the dynamic contrast enhanced. It's zone specific, and it should be interpreted with biopsy data and PSA. And this is what it looks like, the PIRAD score. So T2, uh, diffusion weighted image, dynamic contrast, uh, spectroscopy, if you have it, we don't use that, and I think uh, neither do uh, most people. And you get a score in each one of these from one to five, and you add this, and you get a PIRAD score for each zone from one to five. Uh, we've been doing, of course, systematic biopsies, and just to address the issue that this leaves a lot to be desired, the risk of infection, men don't like it, the negative predictive value of a negative biopsy is only around 65 to 70 percent, so at least a quarter of patients with a negative biopsy still harbor cancer. PSA we talked about, and DRE really doesn't work in these patients. Clinical progression is very uncommon in these men, and if they have it, usually you really miss the boat. Let me just go on to here. There's multiple roles for MRI, perhaps replacing the biopsy in, in men on surveillance, which will mean we have many fewer patients because they won't be overdiagnosed in this zone here for early identification and for uh, long-term follow-up on the patients. What are we looking for? I mentioned something about the Epstein criteria, which were based on Stamey's definition of favorable of clinically insignificant disease as less than 0.5 cc of a Gleason 3 cancer. And this was based on 149 radical cystectomy specimens in the pre-PSA era at Stanford, of whom about 40% had uh, unsuspected prostate cancer, and it was just looking at the volume of the largest 8%, which was the rate of clinical diagnosis. The, uh, the ERSPC group, uh, led by Monique Rubal and Walters was the first author, did exactly the same technique as Stamey did on radical prostatectomy specimens in men diagnosed in ERSPC, where it's estimated the overdiagnosis rate was 50%, and came up with a volume of 1.3 cc's versus 0.5 cc's. And I think this is a major conceptual development because we can find a 1.3 cc cancer with a high degree of reliability you know, uh, with MRI, for example, in a way that a 0.5 cc cancer may elude us. So risk stratification, and Mark mentioned something about this. This is a prostate. This is the typical diagnostic biopsy focused on the peripheral zone. And I thought some of the diagrams we saw in the last talk were great, but it misses the 30, particularly the 30 percent uh, transition zone, anterior prostate. Apex tends to be undersampled, and so does the base. So these are the areas, and in the confirmatory biopsies that we do, we target these three areas to try and evaluate them. But clearly, uh, do, using a transrectal approach, the posterior prostate is much more accessible than the anterior prostate and, and the apex. So that is the problem. And this is just an example of one of these cases uh, where, you know, the, the detail in here is, is really remarkable. And in the absence, in this patient, single positive core for Gleason 6, one can have a strong degree of confidence that there's not a significant large lesion there. And again, Mark showed some of these kinds of pictures, which large anterior cancers. There's one paper from Hopkins, men on surveillance having radical prostatectomy for a variety of reasons, 100% of them who had cancers more than one cc had anterior cancers. So here's, it's as simple as the peripheral zone biopsies missing these large cancers. 
Now, despite the fact that we haven't had MRI in the surveillance population, there's only a 3% mortality rate. So these cases are not that common, but you can imagine finding these at diagnosis instead of five years later may make a real difference in terms of that worrying few percent of patients who, who are not well served by surveillance. Just another example of a kind of anterior cancer, T2 uh, uh, ADC or restriction and a dynamic contrast image, a diffusion weighted image showing anterior cancers seen very clearly. And there's a number of recent papers about this. This is just one of them, negative predictive value, which I think is the key figure. The likelihood of the MRI is negative that the patient has higher grade cancer in this Sloan Kettering series of about 400 patients on surveillance was 97% versus at best 70, 75% with systematic biopsies. So this is the kind of number that will even reassure the most ardent radical prostatectomy advocates that you can take a patient with low grade disease and say he's got only a 3% chance of harboring higher grade disease if his MRI is negative. And by the same token, uh, if the MRI shows a, a high at PIRADS 5, 90 to 98% positive predictive value for high grade cancer. So this is very, to me, very powerful data which should really influence practice. This is some data from Toronto and essentially it showed more or less the same thing, which is we looked at the discordance rate. The patients who had, where the MRI and the biopsy showed the same thing was about 40%. About 40% had a negative MRI. Where the MRI showed a lesion that was not suspected, almost 80% were upgraded. So really adding something significant to the systematic biopsies. Another role for this and I actually think this is Mark Emberton's case, is uh, uh, the value on surveillance, because we've only started doing this in the last couple of years and don't have, uh, don't have the long-term follow-up. So this is a guy who was T1A after a TERP, and he had a negative MRI at the time and was followed and two years later progressed to a lesion that was absolutely not present. I don't know if you can see that with the lights on, but he went from essentially a minimal lesion on T2 to a large lesion, negative to strongly co uh, uh, contrast enhanced and uh, strong on a diffusion weighted image. So the value in surveillance, what we don't know is how often these should be done, but clearly there's, there's potentially a role there. Uh, there's some just recent data from, a, again, a UCL group of a group of patients mostly low risk, 40% had a visible lesion, which is about the rate that's been reported in surveillance candidates, remarkably similar to the upgrading rate that's been reported in men having a radical prostatectomy who are candidates for surveillance. 47% over time showed radiologic progression in the ones who had a lesion compared to only about 18% of those who had no lesion. So the presence of a lesion is predictive for subsequent progression. Uh, Seventy-six percent of the low-risk men were stable on the MRI. The remainder, again, had evidence of progression, and also a large proportion of the intermediate risk were stable on MRI. So we're just learning what the significance of MRI stability means, and this is an area that is ripe for further evaluation. Uh, another study showing the neg confirming the negative predictive value for uh, a negative MRI in the 93 to 97% range. A number of groups are looking at this with randomized trials. This is one we're doing in Ontario, taking men on surveillance, randomizing them between standard systematic biopsy at about nine months versus MRI targeted and systematic biopsies. And the goal is to demonstrate you can find the high grade disease by only doing a targeted biopsy, and if the MRI is negative, not, not uh, subjecting the patient to biopsy, this would be a huge advance. Men on surveillance do not like uh, repeat biopsies, and this would make it much more appealing. So there are questions. Uh, what do you do with the guy who's got an MR lesion and is Gleason 6? Does that mean he's got something worse than you suspect? <laughs> 
uh, this is uh, with targeted biopsy, not known. In men on surveillance, should the MRI use, be used as a trigger for biopsy? Or if they've got a PIRADS lesion, you have a prostate cancer diagnosis, it looks bad, should you just go ahead and take out the prostate? Uh, I have done both, but I'm not sure what the right thing is. How often should the MRI be performed if you're following patients? We're biopsying at less and less intervals. Probably every five years is enough, but we don't have experience with that yet. And the role of biomarkers. Now, I just wanted to, and these are some of the other trials that are going on. Well, Laurie, let me we just um, get into the, you think we could go into the discussion now because we're unfortunately so late on schedule. How would you dare with, you know, discussing, discussing with Mark both uh, data of your talks? Very, let's have you summary. Thank you very much. I will, I will call it quits there. <laughs> so, sorry, Laurie, but uh, we, we no. just have to move and uh, get into the crunchy part now with Mark. So, um, first, from the floor, any questions? Yes, please. From Dr. Uniman. Actually, to both speakers, um, don't you compare apples with peers when you talk about transrectal biopsies versus perineal biopsies? Because if you just would perform perineal biopsies, you would even find with a normal transrectal ultrasound biopsies more cancers. And uh, so the first thing is, can we really compare the normal way we do it right now and as we train our residents in doing transrectal biopsies versus perineal biopsies, which are targeted biopsies? I fully agree what you say, but I think it's difficult to compare the, both groups. And the second thing is, when you perform perineal biopsies, do you put the patient on general anesthesia or do you locally? Lots of questions. So I don't think it matters how you biopsy. It's all about location. And some of the, the Siddiqui study was transrectal. Um, we do them transparently because the multi-resistant sepsis rate in London is so high. We'll kill too many patients if we do it transrectally. That's the only reason. It's actually, it makes targeting a bit easier. But it doesn't matter. The, the, the issue is, is location. And yes, uh, once you get down to fewer cores, and the average now is three or four, per targeted lesion, we're doing all these under local anesthetic. Yes, please. Uh, one, question to, uh, to uh, one question from a pathologist this time, uh, because when you start doing these targeted biopsies, uh, do you put all your biopsies, all the cores, in one single container and expect a result on all the cores at the same time? Or would you prefer to have a Gleason score on each of the separate cores? What's that? <laughs> so in the trials, they're all in separate, and they are, they're orientated, and they go in cassettes, um, and we know the sequence, so we're trying to work out how many cores you need per target, because we don't really know that yet. But obviously, in day-to-day -day practice, the targeted cores go in one pot, and the non-targeted cores go in your standard array. Correct, that yeah. Their yes. But and, now, but and that's a danger, and I, I think we're, we're agreeing. So um, every cancer has inherent heterogeneity. If you sample that tumor frequently, one of your cores will be short and just contain pattern four, and your pathologist would call that four plus four, eight. And you cannot help but ignore that. It's quite interesting psychologically. But obviously, the overall pattern will be very accurate because the pathologist has lots of tissue from that lesion. The overall will be four plus three. Both. Both. Uh, and, I think, and I think as we get into biomarkers, this really rich material will allow biomarker discovery to really take off. I think biomarker discovery has been hampered because our verification test has been so poor. Okay. Last question. <laughs> well, the, the, uh, I think from the MRI, you follow the index tumor. And certainly we know that the transitional zone carcinomas are the low-grade cancers and pretty much very indolent tumors. From my experience, sometimes the transitional zone tumors uh, are the index tumors. Uh, in the prostatectomy, we find multifocality, and the higher grade cancers in peripheral zones, which are very small, often penetrating the capsule, which you probably do not see on your MRI. Well, how would we deal with those patients? Well, I, so I, listen, you've raised a great point. I mean, the Achilles heel of all of these approaches is the small, 
potentially lethal Gleason 4 cancer. Now, according to most pathologists, they are unusual. Typically, what you see is either a large Gleason 4 plus 4, or you see a large 3 plus 3, 3 with some 4 in it. And so the, the scenario you're describing, we are never going to win if there is a very small, lethal uh, focus of cancer. No imaging is going to find that very well. But these are rare. And I don't know, Theo, you might want to comment on that. How, I know, you're not paying attention. How often, how, the question is how often you see a small focus of high-grade cancer or is it usually embedded in a larger, it's either a large lesion or in a large 3 plus 4 type of thing? Yeah, so that's also my understanding. Thank you, Theo. All right, well, we need to close. Thanks so much for the great uh, talks, both of you.